Ignition sequence starts. Good morning from Houston, Texas, home of the Johnson Space Center. You're looking at a view of Mission Control Houston's International Space Station Flight Control Room. The flight controllers you see here are monitoring the space station systems and working with the Expedition 67 crew as they carry out their daily agendas on board. The space station crew is nearing the end of a work week that, as is almost always the case, was full of advancing scientific research. But they also spent some time on the laboratory itself, keeping it in tip-top shape and getting it ready to support all the mission goals. But don't just take it from me, here's Nofer. Welcome to Space to Ground, I'm Nilofer Ramji. NASA and SpaceX are now targeting Thursday, July 14th for the launch of the next commercial resupply services mission to the International Space Station. The new target launch date for CRS-25 supports ongoing Dragon spacecraft inspections as well as repair and replacement of any components that could have been degraded by exposure to the monomethyl hydrazine vapor found during testing in early June. The new date also allows for launch of the uncrewed cargo mission for the earliest possible rendezvous opportunity with the space station. Research has shown that living in microgravity can cause changes to astronauts' immune systems, similarly to how aging impacts them. An experiment launching on SpaceX CRS-25 seeks to better understand those changes and if they reverse upon return to Earth. Immunosenescence will use tissue chips, small devices that contain human cells in a 3D matrix, to study these changes and how the immune system recovers after returning to Earth. What we learn could help us develop treatments to protect astronauts on future long-duration missions. It could also lead to development of more effective treatments for immune system aging for patients back on our home planet. Another investigation launching aboard the Cargo Dragon will study how soil microbes behave in space. Soil microbes could be used to help make conditions on the surface of the Moon and Mars more favorable for plant growth, and could also be used to help grow crops on space stations during long-duration spaceflight. The DYNAMOS investigation will compare Earth impacts on soil microbes with impacts from the space environment. Results could support design of life support systems using the natural processes carried out by soil microorganisms for future space exploration missions. For all of the latest on the science taking place aboard the Orbiting Laboratory, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at space underscore station. That's space Instagram for this week. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next week. The next SpaceX Dragon cargo ship set to launch to the International Space Station is going to carry supplies for the human crew members and science materials to further a range of research in orbit. That includes hardware to measure the composition of Earth's mineral dust. They're doing this for scientists who want to understand how dust particles carried by wind contribute to heating and cooling the planet. Mineral dust can travel thousands of miles where it interacts throughout the Earth system. In our case, we're going to study how that mineral dust heats or cools planet Earth. Currently, we aren't sure whether mineral dust heats the planet or cools the planet. We're looking at dust sources on the Earth's surface, so deserts, arid regions. Wind can basically emit that dust into the atmosphere. Um, and so we are very interested in knowing what it is, and depending on what it is, it'll tell us whether or not it is warming or cooling our environment. Since some minerals are dark, maybe more red, they would absorb solar energy and they could be heating elements. Other cases, minerals are bright white and they could reflect sunlight back into space and cool the atmosphere. And these desert dust plumes, once they get into the atmosphere, they, they are not small. If you look at some of the satellite imagery, you can see these huge desert dust plumes of larger than Spain, for example, um, coming across the North Atlantic. So this is an important impact potentially on climate change looking into the future as more lands become dust forming regions, as they become desertified, we'll want to understand how those changes will affect our climate in the future. 
This experiment is so important for us to understand what's going on at the surface of the Earth in, in terms of the mineralogy and the composition. on a resupply service vehicle to the International Space Station. And once we're on the ISS, we would attach to the exterior of the space station. And I can't imagine a better platform than the International Space Station to measure uh, Earth science. EMIT is an imaging spectrometer, so it has a telescope, which basically collects a lot of light, and we image all of that light onto uh, the slit of what we call a spectrometer. It measures light in many different wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. Our eyes see three wavelengths, red, green, and blue, but EMIT sees in hundreds of wavelengths out into the, the infrared. They give us signatures, like fingerprints. As we're traveling on the ISS, looking down at Earth, focusing on the spectral characteristics of minerals that are on the Earth. And so the imaging spectrometer allows us to detect those spectral signatures that tell us what type of mineral they're actually looking at. This is setting a new benchmark for the quality of this class of instrumentation. This is just extraordinary. It's really a convergence of state-of-the-art technology and state-of-the-art science so that we better understand the climate system and how it's responding to humans. One of the earliest research goals for space flight scientists was to learn all they could about the impact the lack of gravity had on the bodies of astronauts. Bodies that were designed and developed to exist in this particular gravity strength here on Earth. Over the years, there have been studies targeting many of the body systems because we are trying to make space exploration as safe as possible for the people we send out there. These days, the researchers are especially interested in the impact of weightlessness on the astronauts' eyes. Understanding the effects of microgravity on the human body is essential to enabling astronauts to travel through the harsh environment of space for months or even years. Significant changes to the body's skeletal and muscle systems have been studied for decades, and strategies to maintain physical fitness are being applied through various countermeasures, including vigorous exercise aboard the International Space Station. But scientists and researchers still have a lot to learn, including how time spent in space affects the eyes and brain. Even during a trip as short as two weeks, vision changes occur for about a third of American astronauts. When the trip is longer, say four to six months, that figure may double. But before potential solutions can be proposed, scientists first have to understand what's causing these changes. On Earth, gravity forces a body's natural blood volume downward, below the waist. Our heart forces it back up to the areas above the waist, including our eyes. But what happens to that volume of blood and other fluids when gravity is no longer pulling them down? The human body has an amazing ability to adapt. Sensors in the upper body note when too much fluid is being received, so the body will decrease its overall blood volume in microgravity. However, this response doesn't always completely counter these fluid shifts. This can sometimes be seen in pictures or videos of astronauts aboard the space station. If their faces look puffy, it can indicate there's too much fluid in their head. Does this fluid also accumulate in or around the eyes? Vision researchers are working to better understand whether the chronic fluids shift toward the head during spaceflight are causing the shape of the eye to change, or if fluid is accumulating at the back of the eye. An imaging technique called optical coherence tomography uses a special camera to take pictures of the back of the eye and helps scientists to better understand the effects of increased fluid accumulation found in the tissue there. Dr. Stephen Laurie is the lead scientist for spaceflight associated neuroocular syndrome research. He says we have known since astronauts flew short duration space shuttle missions that vision changes during spaceflight occur faster than would be expected during the same time period on Earth. However, once we started seeing swelling at the back of the eye surrounding the optic nerve, this became more concerning because it has the potential to lead to long-term changes in vision that cannot be fixed with new prescription lenses. 
Another challenge for scientists is that astronauts may not conform to a one-size-fits-all treatment approach. While all astronauts experience chronic weightlessness, about 70% show the earliest signs of fluid accumulating at the back of the eye, and only 15% show more concerning signs of this. When they return to Earth's gravity, these changes can take up to a year to resolve, with some changes to the eye never fully returning to how they were before spaceflight. Both men and women have been affected in either or both eyes. Dr. Lori concludes, researchers and medical doctors closely monitor astronauts during and after spaceflight to determine if any permanent vision changes will emerge, while also continuing with research to learn more about the underlying causes of these changes. For more information about how astronauts maintain their health on board the space station, go to www.nasa.gov slash ISS science. To discover more about the space on, around, and beyond our planet, visit science.nasa.gov. We know astronauts on the International Space Station spend a lot of their time doing experiments, and some of their time keeping the space station operating safely and smoothly. But sometimes they get to have a little extra fun, and they demonstrate some concepts for us here down on Earth. In this demonstrations episode, astronaut Shane Kimbrough explains the ways that several simple machines that we see here on Earth every day are supporting the work being done up in space. Hello and welcome to the International Space Station. My name is Shane Kimbrough and I'm an astronaut living and working here 250 miles above the Earth. Today we're going to be learning about what a simple machine is and exploring the different ways we're using simple machines up here in low Earth orbit. A simple machine is an object that helps us to easily accomplish a task by changing the direction or amount of a force. There are six different types of simple machines. A screw, inclined plane, wedge, lever, wheel, and axle and pulley. When we combine two or more of these simple machines together, they are called compound machines. Let's dive into the purpose of each of these devices and how we are using them up here on the station. A screw is a simple machine that helps to fasten two objects together. Up here we use a variety of screws in order to keep our station intact, especially as we deal with microgravity causing objects to drift around. Here's an example of a screw that we may use on a spacewalk. Inclined planes are a broad range of simple machines that use an angled plane to accomplish different tasks. Down on Earth, you use inclined planes to move things easily. But here in microgravity, we don't need inclined planes to help us move objects. If you look closely at a screw, you will see that it is made up of a rod with an inclined plane that spirals around it. This inclined plane helps the screw to fasten to another object. Another simple machine using inclined planes to accomplish something is a wedge. A wedge consists of two inclined planes combined to split or separate objects. We often use wedges to cut objects here on the International Space Station. A wheel and axle is, is exactly what it sounds like. A wheel is attached to an axle, helping it to rotate and move easily without friction. We sometimes use wheels to help move items that we need to be able to travel without floating away. An example of this would be the wheels on our crew equipment and translation aid cart. It is attached to a track using wheel and axles for movement, so we are able to use it on our spacewalks without the possibility of it drifting off. I mentioned compound machines before, and our Advanced Resistive Exercise Device, or ARED, is a great example of that. It combines the simple machines, levers, and pulleys to help us maintain muscle and bone density in micro-G. Levers use a surface situated on a fulcrum, or pivoting point, to move an object. Pulleys are simple machines that use a wheel and axle to change the direction of an object. The pulleys inside A-RED allow us to set the level of resistance for our workouts.
Thank you for learning about Simple Machines with me today. Now I'm gonna send you back to Earth to design a compound machine you think we could use up here on the International Space Station. See you next time. After being together every day for many, many months preparing for a long duration space flight, you'd think the astronauts of NASA's SpaceX Crew 4 would know one another pretty well. And you'd be right, even down to them being pretty sure who was going to tell the next bad joke. Watch as Cho Lindgren, Bob Hines, Jessica Watkins, and Samantha Cristoforetti have fun answering questions about each other. They also ponder the 1995 versions of themselves and offer their thoughts on the great baristas of history and the wonders of American takeout. I think First question, are we ready? I think we're ready. Okay. <laughs> They've been running this whole time. <laughs> Charlie is obviously on top of this. <laughs> and start. Okay. <laughs> Who would win in a foot race? <laughs> Wadi. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. We should probably settle it. That's. One. We should probably we have take, a foot race. Yeah. We take 1995 farmer. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Against 1995 you, 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 me? You get the guess. <laughs> yes, it's the only way I have a chance. <laughs> Maybe. Oh man, this is a big one. Who do you think will make the best coffee in space? Chill. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Samantha, That's you were a barista, it. right? Yeah. At one point. Yeah. Oh yeah. Again, like I don't think that this has to be a who's the best. I think that as this is just like a, as long as there's good coffee. coffee. As long as there is. Yeah. 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 I, I, I'm the that. best coffee drinker. Does that count? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty good at drinking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm working on it. <clears throat> uh, I'm gonna work on it. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Who oh, is no. the bigger sci-fi fan? Oh, that's a tough one. That's a tough um, one. What level of sci-fi? <laughs> like good sci-fi? Right, like I'm the, like the well, this is Samantha. Let, like... let, let, let. The <laughs> here's like Star Wars, and here's everything else. <laughs> All right, next yeah, question. I think that's <laughs> settled. <laughs> I think hey, it's pretty cool. we can agree that right. we're both. <laughs> and then we're gonna convert. And then Wadi. there's Wadi. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Power up there. Yeah, we have to introduce Wadi to yes, all the sci-fi exactly. pre 1995. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> what science experiments will your crew members be best at? Holy cow, that's a tough one. All right, well, Chad's a doctor. So... Armor, skirt, and grass. Darn it. <laughs> you beat me to it. <laughs> All right, Farmer is a grip and grass specialist. Mm -hmm. No questions about that. What it is our Crew anything that has to do with rocks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. rocks. And uh, Chell, anything that has to do with uh, food. Not that we would ever do anything <laughs> like that, but like, you know, cutting and suturing. And <laughs> you know about Who experiments did. we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, this. <laughs> All right. What is my worst habit? No, what is your worst no, habit? Your... It says what is your. You're what is me? your worst <laughs> habit that you think would annoy your crewmates? Uh, telling bad jokes? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would never happen. That would never happen. <laughs> is there a, that's true. <laughs> is there a habit you've picked up from your crewmates? Bad jokes. Bad jokes. <laughs> yes. You have, for somebody who rolls their eyes at his jokes all the time, you have st started stepping up yeah, with your own. Right here, why? Yep. So Come on. It's really. <laughs> Resistance is futile. It just wraps up on you. <laughs> it's just like. <laughs> yeah, a long way to go. It's contagious. <laughs> yeah, we call it bad jokes. <laughs> Who has the worst poker face? That would be me, probably. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. be. even if your face doesn't give away, your gesture. <laughs> it's all inside. Yeah. Samantha, your hands aren't moving. What's wrong? That's your outside hands. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> Who do you learn from the most? I think you guys are a team there. Yeah. I think that. 
Samantha yeah. learns all about American exactly. culture from that. That is absolutely true. <laughs> and you American cuisine in particular. Cuisine. Yes. <laughs> right. I, I, I'm a kind of that with high cuisine. <laughs> like all that no, sophisticated. You're teaching us high cuisine. We're just teaching you like just. eating food in parking lots. <laughs> If looking down at Earth is the dream of the astronauts and cosmonauts who go to space, a close second on their wish list is always doing a spacewalk. Floating outside, off the planet, in a spaceship built for one. In this episode of Down to Earth Conversations, we hear firsthand what it's like to take those steps on a walk of a lifetime. What about doing a spacewalk do you think would be the most surprising for people to hear about? Like what do you think is the most interesting aspect of it that maybe isn't just, well, obviously you're outside in space. Yeah, yeah. There's so many really fascinating things about doing a spacewalk. It is entirely your sensory overload. It's, it is every sensation that you have as a human being wrapped up in six hours. First of all, as just to take you through like getting out the door as you're getting up suited up, it's like this is something professionally that you've looked forward to for a long time and practiced. You know it's it's not gonna be easy. You're super focused, you've studied, so you're you know you're on the top of your game and you go out the door and move your way over to where you're supposed to go to work and then the sun starts to come up and you see the planet right below you. I mean, you have total control of that, of where you're, where you're looking and it's a little shocking and somewhat a little scary. It makes you sort of hold on a little bit for a second, <laughs> but double check your tethers, make sure you're okay. Okay, my heartbeat just went down, I'm okay. Now the sun's up so I'm getting a little bit hot because I'm working real a whole lot and then the sun starts to go down 45 minutes later oh man now I'm getting super cold and I'm starting to get hungry because I'm out there for a couple hours in the middle of it you're having a conversation with the folks on the ground so it's tying you right back to earth on my first spacewalk we were up hanging out at the solar array <laughs> and uh, we happened to fly over Canada and the northern lights were below you it's like holy moly that's, that's amazing. amazing that was compelling it left an impact on me because it it reminded me that there's so much out there in space that's going on that we have absolutely no control of. You know, probably in those northern lights, my background is as a, as a scientist, but I'm sure that it, it started from some type of solar flare and then the magnetic field of the Earth gets activated is that particles come toward the Earth and we can't do anything about that. That's what it is. And I think that was the most compelling feeling. Like we squabble down here about energy or whatever we squabble about down here on Earth, which is very inconsequential to really what's going on in the rest of the universe. I mean, we are only one little planet, but it is getting affected by the rest of the universe. And I think that really came true when I, when I was sitting there and that green stuff was below me, hitting the earth. And it is what it is, you know? We are just yeah. part of it. So it's like all of that, and then at the end of it, you're like, wait a minute, tick tock, you know, like we have to get back in the house, right? So you have to go back, you know, then your brain starts to tick again. Did it get everything done? Where's all my equipment? Where's my buddy? Where's my partner? Make sure all of that, you know, sort of like survival skills, I think at the end, this sort of tick in, you know, come to, come to play. And every now and then it dawns on you that like, hey, I'm in a very dangerous place, actually. The main goal of this spacewalk is actually to go outside and come back in both of you and I think it, it finally at some point in time that that kicks in so we, we practice all this on earth but there's always something that you don't anticipate either it's too hot or too cold for a piece of metal to work correctly you might have to wait and so there's a there's a lot of highs that you got something done really quick and fast and you are successful a lot of lows of like I'm working my as hard as I can and I and I can't get this done and maybe you have to alter the plan and call your call your buddy in to help you out. So it is really a huge spectrum. What is it like or what does it feel like to see the outside of the ISS so close knowing it's just like falling, controlled falling, uh -huh. just through space? Um, it, you, you recognize that it's sort of fragile <laughs> and you're living in there. I think that's one of the things and it's also incredibly beautiful. It sounds sort of silly maybe, but it, it really feels like you're in space. You are really part of this 
this universe versus inside you're sort of like on a ship. I guess it's equivalent to like when you're on a boat mm -hmm. and you're on the boat and you're having a, a pretty cool view of the water and all that kind of stuff. And then if you jump out and you go for a swim and you have some goggles on and you're looking around underneath, I think it's probably that different. It's like you're in it, right? You're, yeah. you're, you are in it. I think that's probably a, a good description of it. I had the opportunity to be on the top of P6 when we had a, a, a solar ray sticking up and then look down at it and it was super cool. I also had the opportunity to be on the front of it, like a, somebody on the front of a <laughs> ship, you know, like, uh, like doing that type of thing. And that's your house, that's your home, that's your base. You want to stay connected to it, you don't want to go away from it. It's humongous. It's absolutely <laughs> humongous and you realize that um, you're pretty far away from the whole, the, you know, the door to get in. Uh, but. Uh, it's an engineering marvel and, and you look at all the different pieces and parts that came from all the different agencies and countries and it's uh it's amazing that we were able to put that all together so it's humbling super humbling because you know you know you're just one guy out there hopefully you're not making a mess of it and making a mistake and all the work of all those people i mean it's culminated into that amazing laboratory it, it makes you stop for a minute For astronauts about to fly to the space station, the course of preparing for a six-month mission runs more than two years, although it has its tough elements. Modern technology allows astronauts to train more safely than in the past as they prepare for the missions of today and those of the future. Mission training for astronauts has always been rigorous. Testing our astronauts' limits, abilities, and knowledge is still an integral part of readying them for the tasks they'll carry out in space. In the Apollo era, there were so many more unknowns. Those pioneers used the best of what was available to them at that time and invented the rest. Safety was and is a top concern, but we push boundaries at NASA at great risk Throughout NASA's history, technology has fueled the evolution of our training programs. Virtual reality allows our astronauts the benefit of safely repeating mission-specific events and activities, although some things we do don't look that different from back then. Astronauts have to be prepared for their journeys. It's the nature of all of those who explore. If you want another look at any of the stories we showed you today, head over to YouTube and Facebook at those addresses right there. You'll find them all, along with lots of other great features on a wide variety of NASA topics. If you're looking for good conversation about human spaceflight, check out Houston We Have a Podcast, our weekly show about all aspects of human spaceflight and NASA's missions of exploration. Today, Gary Jordan gathers the podcast team to talk about their favorite episodes as they mark the fifth anniversary of the program. Go to nasa.gov slash podcast for that episode and all of our previous episodes. Plus, you can also find the full library of all NASA podcasts. You can also check them out on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and SoundCloud. And one more thing before you go, you can get the latest from all over NASA delivered to you every week. Just go to nasa.gov slash subscribe to sign up for the NASA newsletter. <laughs>